in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know about you, but last Monday afternoon I was glued to the radio listening to what Boris had to say in the Houses of Parliament about how we might be coming out of the uh, lockdown and all the rest of it. And I was struck by just how buoyed I felt at the very prospect that on the 21st of June there might be no social distancing rules at all. Now, of course, it's all heavily caveated with it's about the data, not the dates, and there are many, many things that can go wrong. But I was equally buoyed uh, by hearing a professor from Oxford University on the radio saying a couple of days later that he thought it was a very doable timescale. So, as the sort of person, I'm a very extrovert person, and I need, I need to sort of you know, rub shoulders with people on a regular basis, this fills me with a lot of joy and a lot of hope. And it raises questions in my mind about what's going on in the first two readings today, which are all about faith and hope, as opposed to legalism. Now, St Paul um, had a real tussle internally about what was the place of the Jewish law now that Jesus had arrived and, and moved things on into a new way of doing things. And he goes into some detail, both in the letter to the Romans and in the letter to the Galatians, about Abraham. And we heard the passage today uh, uh, from Genesis about how Abraham believed that God was going to fulfil his promise, even though it looked hopeless. He was 90 years old and God's saying, you're going to have a son through Sarah, who was 80 years old at the time. You think, hang on a minute, you know, there's a certain amount of biological clock ticking there and I don't think that's going to work. Nevertheless, we are told that Abraham believed God and that because of that belief, belief it was reckoned to him as righteousness, justice. Those two words are both the same. And St Paul seizes on that as being, yeah, this all happened before Abraham was circumcised. Therefore, it happened before anything to do with the law of Moses, because the law of Moses is hundreds of years later. Now, as Christians, we're not under the law of Moses, because, you know, we're not Jewish. Um, and so the, the principle behind Christianity is what Paul is getting at here. That in Christianity, Jesus shows us that believing in God and believing as in trust, trusting in God, hoping in God, is what gives us life. And I thought there was something parallel here going on with what I was feeling while I was listening to the radio on Monday. First of all, we've got the legal things that we are subject to at the moment. And not just sort of in law, but, but just the rules and regulations that we are adhering to in order to bring down cases of coronavirus. And these are very sensible, practical things that work. And in the same way, it was the same with the law of Moses. There were practical details there which worked. Things about how to relate to one another in terms of theft and buying and selling and, and all those sort of ordinary things that we, we, we need rules for in order to order our life and existence and for there to be some sort of peaceful society. But rules in themselves don't give us life. We all know we've got to stay at home and avoid touching each other and avoid breathing on each other and all the rest of it because it's going to save lives. It, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, we all know that it's a really good thing to go and get vaccinated. Now, if you're reading, hearing this and you're sitting there going, well, I'm not sure if I want to get vaccinated, please, please, please get vaccinated because it will save so many people's lives, including your own. Vaccination is the cheapest and safest way of keeping everybody healthy except for one exception, which is drinking clean water. So if you haven't had the vaccine and you're eligible for the vaccine, just go and get the jab. I'm waiting for mine, Jill's had hers. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's something that we can all do together and it saves everybody. 
So anyway, that's, that's like the legal part of it. Get your vaccine, it's something practical that we can do. But getting the vaccine will not save us from despair. It will not save us from all of those touchy-feely things that we all engage with as human beings. What really gives us life is the hope. The hope that we can live freely without having to worry about rules and regulations. We can hope that there will be safety and security and life. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, hmm, he's getting a bit close to you know, idolising Boris here. I'm not, don't worry. What I'm pointing to is the idea that when there is a lack of rules and optimism, that's when we really come to life. Now, it's not Boris that's going to save us. It's not any politician who's going to save us. It's not even the scientists, wonderful as they are, an incredible piece of work they've done. What is going to save us is the coming together of all these different circumstances for us to be able to walk around freely and confidently and be safe. And all of that comes back to God. Now, there's been lots of speculation about, you know, where is God in coronavirus? Has God sent it to punish us? Had God sent it to recorrect us? I don't know, is the straight answer. But what I do look for in God is him bringing about the circumstances that lead to each and every one of us having the possibility of trusting that he is looking after us and trusting that he's going to give us life and hope. And last Monday was, for me, the first big glimpse that whatever else is going to happen, God is going to sort this out. God is going to give us life. God is going to bring us back to himself. Now, let's just turn to the gospel, because this is one of these hard things that Jesus says, where he says, you know, unless you give up yourself, give up your life, you can't be my disciple. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. And there is a sense in which our very life is bound up with what happens over the next few months. And it's not that we're trying to cling on to our own personal existence. We're actually trying to create a corporate salvation. And this is very un unusual for us in the West because we're, we're fixated on, on individualism. But if we as a community and as a society put each other before ourselves, if we are prepared to go the extra mile, if we are prepared to suffer the isolation, and trust me, I've, I've, I've got friends who are literally on their own for weeks on end, and it's that sacrifice that they're willing to make in order so that everybody can live. That, I think, is what Jesus is talking about. We take the rough and the hard bits, not because we're, you know, we don't love ourselves. We take this hard stuff because we do love ourselves. We do love each other and we really want everybody to be safe. And this is also why it's really important that we vaccinate not just this country, but every country in the world. Everybody needs to be vaccinated in order to stop these new variants, which come, may come along and mess it all up. So I would also ask you to have a look at this little website here from UNICEF and the cost of your vaccination. What they're asking is that, that you make a donation to UNICEF based on how much it would cost to vaccinate somebody. Because we're lucky in this country. We have a health service that gives us these vaccinations for free. But there are costs to giving vaccinations to everywhere else. So I would like to invite you, A, to get vaccinated, 
and B, to make a donation for the cost of your vaccination to UNICEF because they will be able to move it forward and help to vaccinate the world. And that way, everybody can know the hope and salvation and life that comes from God. Faith, hope and love abide, these three. Now the greatest of these may be love, but at the moment we really need the faith and we really need the hope. Amen.